So we, are we all set? We're all set? We go. We're all set? Okay, that reminds me. First thing, turn off your communication devices or turn them on vibrate. Um, I did that before I showed up. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining me. My name is Richard White. So I'm the director here of the Center for uh, Political Military Analysis at the Hudson Institute. We're here to discuss a critical issue, the Nuclear Posture Review, and it's uh, fo and focusing on how it, we are going to realize the goals that the review lays out in terms of nonproliferation and nuclear security. Um, as you know, there have been a series of events on DC. Each of the think tanks has had an NPR event. Um, and they were really good. A lot of them are online. The, the NDU one, there was one at Heritage yesterday, Atlantic Council, uh, ISS had them. Um, but the focus of these other events was, was pretty much on the question of defense, deterrence, uh, nuclear use, and modernization, Russia's, uh, how Russia is responding, and so on. Whereas today, we thought we'd take a, a little different uh, spin. We would talk, we'd focus on some of the issues that were at the end of the NPR uh, on, on the question of uh, realizing the goals of nonproliferation, uh, how to prevent other countries from getting nuclear weapons, how to keep terrorists from getting a nuclear material. And the NPR is very uh, straightforward and traditional in its statement. It reaffirms support for these goals. Uh, it talks a lot about supporting the, the uh, nonproliferation treaty, and it talks a bit uh, uh, some about no, the importance of developing a defense in depth against nuclear terrorism, including a lot of focus on forensics, uh, being able to attribute where the material is coming from, preventing material from becoming loose, preventing terrorists from accessing them, and uh, holding responsible those who, who support nuclear terrorism or, or any kind of terrorism. A uh, bit of a debate on the question. Uh, 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 since some people think that this is a you know, very good approach, it's going to discourage nonproliferation because the U.S. is reaffirming its support for allies. So countries that might consider getting nuclear weapons, Japan, South Korea, can be reassured they don't need to. The U.S. is going to uh, defend them. Uh, it's going to tell other countries that if they support nuclear terrorism, they, they risk um, being held uh, fully accountable by the United States and with all means at our disposal. Others worry that the, the approach is not as uh, strong, not as highly emphasized, uh, and that it, there's some of the new modernization uh, uh, supplements, as they're called, may encourage other countries to get nuclear weapons and may make it harder at the NPT review conference. So we want to talk through these issues. We have three great panelists. Um, I want to uh, begin, though, by thanking the uh, MacArthur Foundation, the, John, uh, the um, foundation supporting us on in both working on both arms uh, nonproliferation and nuclear security. And we're holding these discussions to, to, to develop these issues. Uh, after the three panelists speak, we're going to go to a question and answer session. You're, you're free to make comments. I'll try and we'll, um, get, the event is live streamed, so people are going to be able to send me questions or comments online as well. Uh, just email me, and I'll, I'll mention this again later, is at whites at hudson.org. The Twitter, if you want to tweet about what we're talking about today, that's great. And that's at Hudson Institute, one word, um, with a capital H and capital I. Our uh, first speaker, uh, Rebecca Heinrichs, is a colleague of mine at Hudson Institute. She's a senior fellow here. A uh, prolific writer on international relations and national security issues. Uh, her, her, one of her specialties is nuclear deterrence and missile defense. Uh, she has benefited from working for, uh, in Congress as a, an assistant for a member of Congress on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, one of her contributions there was to set up a bipartisan missile defense caucus, so I think she's and well prepared to help us. What I hope to achieve today is develop some kind of bi uh, consensus on, on um, a bipartisan consensus on how we can cooperate to deal with the nuclear security and nonproliferation challenges. And then I'll introduce the other speakers as they really go. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, it's it's especially uh, fun for me today because I have Simon here, and Simon and I worked together. How many years ago? It was I think a decade ago. Mm -hmm. It was a decade ago um, when he was working for Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher. I was working for Congressman Trent Franks, both in the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. So we've been through many briefings together. Sure. And um, so it's a lot of fun to have him uh, here with me on the stage. Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, a, a, a lot of folks think that the, the, the Trump nuclear posture review is, was, is very, very different from the Obama, the 2010 Obama nuclear posture review. 
Um, in fact, there are a lot of commonality between the two. There's a lot of common others. Um, it maintains um, the consensus in a lot of ways um, from the, the, the sort of the, the consensus developed in the defense Establishment is a very pejorative word these days, but um, the, from the defense community, national security community, and and one of the things that that um, that pertains most uh, that's most relevant to this conversation is is the piece where it says I'll just read this. This 2010 NPR says that one of the commitments is renewing the U.S. commitment to hold fully accountable any state terrorist group or other non-state actor that supports or enables terrorist efforts to obtain or use weapons of mass destruction, whether by facilitating, financing, or providing expertise or safe havens for such efforts. Um, that language is in the Obama NPR. In, in this, uh, in the Trump NPR, the language says that for effective deterrence, the United States will hold fully accountable any state terrorist group or other non-state actor that supports or enables terrorist efforts to obtain or employ nuclear devices. So very similar language. Um, I'm not even sure I would say it's even stronger in this one. It's just, um, it's clear. It's just, it repeats what, what the previous administration um, said it was uh, going to do. Um, what is different, though, in the two documents has to do with what is different globally. The threats that have changed, um, gotten worse uh, since the 2010 NPR and, and the one, the 2010 NPR. Mainly, um, the, the, the change in what's going on in Russia and China, and most specifically, Russia. And, and that is that Russia is in open violation of the uh, INF Treaty, um, which, um, as you may know, it's the, it's the Cold War Treaty that eliminates an entire class, the only treaty that eliminates an entire class uh, of nuclear missiles. And, um, and, and not only is Russia, Russia we, we know that Russia started violating that treaty back during the Obama administration by testing these, these missiles, but, but then now we know that they're deploying them. And, and so the Obama administration was unable to force the Russians to comply with that treaty. The, the Trump administration has so far not been able to, to get the Russians to comply with that treaty. Um, and so if we're talking about nonproliferation, and one, preventing terrorists from getting a hold of these uh, very dangerous weapons, but also the, the, the overall nonproliferation regime and actually making sure that it's, that, it, um, that it's legitimate, that it means something, that it works, we have, we have to enforce it. We have to enforce, enforce these treaties. And so uh, in, in the Trump NPR, it is not as optimistic, I would say, as the Obama NPR is on um, uh, having further arms control agreements. Um, and, and that was something that was uh, elevated in the Obama NPR, having further arms control agreements. The, the Trump uh, NPR says that it would be, that it still values arms control agreements, but it says, and it says the United States is committed to arms control efforts that advance US allied and, and partner security, but they have to be verifiable and enforceable and include partners that comply responsibly with their obligations. Such arms control efforts can contribute to the US capability to sustain strategic stability. But it's a little pessimistic here. We're not looking forward to new ones because um, there are countries that continue to violate standing ones. Which brings me to my favorite quote from President Obama, um, which he said, rules must be binding, violations must be punished, words must mean something. OK, so I would actually argue and this sometimes, I'm sure, irritates my arms control friends that who, who, who really focus more on the, um, the value of arms control. I'm a little bit more pessimistic simply because arms control has not slowed down um, the, the determination of, of countries like North Korea, for instance, um, in pursuing and valuing having a nuclear weapons capability. But, but one of the things that, that I would argue is that the, the Trump NPR is actually a very, despite its pessimism about further arms control treaties, is an arms control, is very, very heavy on arms control in that it is determined to make sure that the INF treaty in particular is followed. And so it is looking for ways to actually force Russia to once again comply with that treaty. Okay, and, and we can go into to details about how it does that some of the more controversial aspects of the treaty. One um, is that we are 
looking at um, changing the, the, the ballistic, the submarine ballistic missile to making it um, a low yield. And you can, you can do that. You can make that change quite easily and very affordably. And then another option um, it, it's looking at is to have uh, bring back the sea, sea launch cruise missile. Um, and then and both of those things would not only sort of shore up the credibility in that particular region, um, and by the way, our, our, our ally, and I'll get to this last point before I turn it over, our, our, our Asian allies really appreciated having that particular option in the United States nuclear deterrent arsenal. But uh, President Obama um, eliminated that capability. And so we're going to bring reintroduce that um, option again. And both of these things, though, though some critics of the Trump NPR would say, isn't the state destabilizing? Well, no, you have to enforce current treaties. And if, if parties to those treaties, mainly Russia in this particular instance, is not going to abide by that treaty, the United States is not going to remain um, party to a treaty in which it's only tying its own arms behind its back and the other, the other country isn't, isn't doing that. So this is sort of pinch Russia to try to get Russia to once again comply. Um, and another aspect of the, of the NPR says the United States will then begin research and development towards um, testing, you know, working towards those uh, ground launch cruise missiles so that in the event that the treaty does fall apart, the United States then has that capability so that we're not kind of standing there um, behind uh, um, where Russia is. And then the other, the other thing, um, Richard mentioned it, and I think it, it's so critical to, to understand this particular part, and it's underappreciated when it comes to um, non-proliferation efforts. And that is our allies that have uh, sworn off having their own nuclear capabilities, nuclear deterrents, that rely, they did, they did that in order to, um, they did that in exchange for American nuclear assurances. They get a say in what the United States has that assures them. So oftentimes, you know, I, I will have um, some of my friends say, well, can't U.S. conventional weapons take care of any threat against China or in, this or in a particular case, Russia? Um, if it's conventional non-nuclear, doesn't that, doesn't that suffice? If it, if it can militarily respond and target particular assets that those countries value, isn't that enough? Um, to which I respond, well, this isn't really, a, it's not a math problem. It's a psychology problem that we're trying to fix. Part of it is you do have to have the actual capability to hold those targets um, at risk, but you, you also have to convince the adversary that what you're threatening them with is, is not worth whatever the thing is that they're trying to pursue, that they're willing to actually use aggression to pursue. That's the deterrent piece. And then the assurance piece is you actually have to have a capability that assures our allies. So it matters what Japan thinks that the United States has. And if Japan is not assured and does not believe that what the United States has is sufficient for their own assurance, Japan will move towards getting their own capabilities that, that would provide, uh, their, you know, that would assure their own public and government. And you can see that Japan under Abe is moving towards a more muscular um, foreign policy and military presence. And, um, and the same goes for South Korea. Um, you know, that the South Koreans have, if, you, if there's been recent polling, that the South Koreans are in favor of them having, having their own nuclear capability. Um, there have been talks. Obviously, this is not moon. But um, there have been talks that there are government officials in South Korea that would like to see the United States having a um, just nuclear deployments there. That would be the first step. Um, if you start to see a break in, their, in, their, uh, in the credibility of our assurance, they would want the United States to deploy once again nuclear um, weapons there. The U.S. government at this stage has not thought that that is necessary, but if, if their allies start to really get nervous, um, that would be the next step before you know, they would start thinking about their own capability. Um, and then, of course, you can see that it's happening right now with uh, Saudi Arabia. If Saudi Arabia thinks that Iran is going to have, have a credible, viable nuclear capability, you better believe the Saudis are going to want that capability as well. And so you can see how um, the, 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 the force structure and the nuclear posture that the United States has um, will affect how other countries, um, and especially our allies, uh, determine what it is that they need that they believe is necessary for their own um, peace and security. Um, so I'll go ahead and leave that there and then turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you very much for your presentation. 
Our next speaker will be Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. She's currently a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, and she recently founded a new NGO and is the president of that NGO. It's a Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation, uh, abbreviated as WCAPS. Is there a website? Yeah. Yes, same WCAPS. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. And from 2009 to 2017, she served as coordinator for threat reduction programs in the United States. And I remember when she was serving, she was very good about coming around to the NGO community and explaining to us what the administration was doing in terms of realizing these goals. So looking mm -hmm. forward to hearing your assessment of the current uh, approach. Great. Well, thank you to the Hudson Institute. Thank you, Richard and MacArthur, for inviting me here. And um, I'm definitely one of the arms control non-proliferation disarmament people. I started working in this area in the early 1990s at the now defunct Arms Control Disarmament Agency, where I worked in the legal office. And I worked on a number of treaties. Uh, last one I worked on was a legal advisor for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So I've been very, very much steeped in the area of uh, arms control non-proliferation for many years. So um, I definitely have a few thoughts about the, um, the NPR. Uh, of course, the NPR is really a strategy document that really outlines what the role of the of nuclear weapons and U.S. strategy is and plans for maintaining and upgrading their nuclear forces. And also important is the overall U.S. approach to nuclear arms control and nonproliferation, which is supposed to be all addressed in the NPR. However, if you look at the NPR, I think two pages um, in total are really dedicated specifically to some of these issues. Um, and then, of course, there's another half page specifically focused on um, the issue of nuclear terrorism. And I, I know my colleague Simon will talk a little bit about that. But it's, uh, it's, it's not very uh, much detail uh, in terms of providing a roadmap to what we want to do in the future in the area of non-proliferation and disarmament. And so it misses the mark in many ways in following what's been done in the past. Um, it really does move us in the wrong direction, and it really devalues the role of arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament in trying to address our threats. It's heavy military, bigger is better, bigger is more, more is better, um, but it's very short on diplomacy, and it's very short on ways in which we can address some of our threats um, in a non-nuclear fashion. Um, on arms control, uh, Russia bears much of the brunt um, of the focus in terms of threats in the NPR, along with China, of course. But there's no real effort, no real steps forward for how we're going to deal with Russia besides looking at some of the nuclear options. Um, and so in, I think back to 2009 at the Prague speech, when Obama said, so today I state clearly and with conviction America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. I am not naive. The goal will not be reached quickly, perhaps not in my lifetime. What we have now is uh, something that's very much against that. Um, and we've had for many years a basic analysis and thought of uh, reducing and eliminating our nuclear weapons, which of course we're obligated to, to do on the nonproliferation treaty. But you're seeing right now, in my opinion, uh, going, going against that trend and actually saying we're going to develop uh, more, more weapons. Uh, the NPR notes that the United States will remain receptive to future arms control negotiations if conditions permit. In negotiations advance U.S. and allied security and verifi that's verifiable and enforceable. I'm not sure what, the, what they mean by the word enforceable here. There's no arms control treaty that has the word enforceable in it. And I'm not sure what does that mean, how are you going to do it, who's going to do it. So they're introducing a phrase and a term in terms of arm control, which really has not been in any arm control in the past. And there might be a reason for that, because I'm not sure how the US would react to somebody saying to us that we're going to enforce something on you. So I wonder how countries are looking at that phrase, enforceable, and wondering what that means. And I'm sure there's diplomats and international lawyers around the world who's wondering, what, what does that mean that the treaty is going to be enforceable? The premise underlying the 2010 NPR was, um, was different from a starting point in some respects. It noted that by reducing the role and numbers of US nuclear weapons, we can put ourselves in a much better position to persuade our NPT partners to join with us in adopting the measures needed to reinvigorate nonproliferation regime. It seems to start from a point where the goal is to continue to seek a reduced role for nuclear weapons. 
whereas 2018 seems to have much more of a premise on we need more nuclear weapons to resolve our problems. And if we have more nuclear weapons, we'll have more deterrence. If we have more deterrence, we will have, we will have fewer problems. <clears throat> this year is the 50th anniversary of the NPT. And, uh, and yet at this point, where we have our 50th anniversary, we see the steps that are being taken that are definitely seen by many as going away from our non-proliferation commitments to reduce nuclear weapons. And instead, we're giving it more prominence. It walks back from the U.S. longstanding support and legal commitment as a member of the non-proliferation treaty to pursue effective measures to reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons, leading to their verification, verifiable elimination. In the past, the NPR has called for the U.S. to reduce the size of its arsenal. It also uh, does not reflect the obligation of the U.S. that we took, as I said, on the Article 6 of the NPT. And one has to wonder what is the effect on other states when we're saying something that we didn't say for 50 years in terms of putting more emphasis on nuclear weapons now at a time when we should be devaluing these weapons and finding other ways to resolve our problems. The commitment of the nuclear armed states to stop developing new nuclear weapons and to draw down is now in question. What will be the ramifications for other countries looking at us, particularly as we continue our discussions with other countries on the non-proliferation treaty? What about the, the New START treaty? There's not much in the, in the NPR about the extension of the New START treaty. There's no commitment to extend it. It expires in 2021. The NPR was an opportunity to say a few words about the administration's views about the future of the New Star Treaty and to consider steps for its extension. We don't want the treaty to lapse in 2021 because there's nothing to replace it and there would be no limits on U.S. and Russian strategic nuclear arms for, for the first time since 1972. And if we also lose that treaty, we also lose the possibility to find ways to verify the size of the, of the uh, Russian arsenal. What about the JCPOA? There is very little mention of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Despite concerns about the Joint, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, it's still in force and is still being verified by the IAEA as well as our own intelligence. This was an opportunity to say a few words about the JCPOA and what it's been accomplishing and what it can accomplish in the future. But we were silent in that. And so we did not say what we could do diplomatically in the future about how we deal with Iran, short of using more and threatening with more weapons. On the CTBT, the NPR asserts that the U.S. does not support the ratification of the CTBT, even though the United States signed the treaty with 182 other nations. The nuclear test ban, of course, is dedicated to reducing the catastrophic nuclear weapons use. We should be finding ways that we can ratify that treaty and join the international community to be doing what we can to reduce nuclear weapons use. The review says that the United States will continue to support the CTBT Preparatory Committee and the related international monitoring system in the International Data Center. It calls upon other states not to conduct nuclear testing and states that the U.S. will not resume nuclear testing unless necessary to ensure the safety and effectiveness of its arsenal. And the U.S. will remain ready to resume nuclear testing, if necessary, to meet severe technical or geopolitical challenges. The Energy Department has reported last year that it wants to reduce the previous readiness timeline for conducting a simple test from 24, which originally 24 to 36 months, down to 6 to 10 months. So what are we supposed to say with all of this? We don't want to ratify the treaty, but we want to stay part of the comprehensive um, uh, uh, the preparatory committee. So we want to continue to have the advantages of being part of the preparatory committee, but we don't want to ratify the treaty. Oh, and by the way, we may need to test you know, in a shorter time frame. So how is that supposed to be received by other countries? The INF Treaty. To counter the Russia verification violation, of the INF Treaty, the review seeks a new, for the time being, ground-launched cruise missile that would uh, put the U.S. in violation of the treaty if it's tested and deployed. The NPR notes that the development of a new nuclear submarine-launched cruise missile, would take new, which takes a while, could serve as a bargaining chip. More specifically, it states that if Moscow returns to compliance with its arms control obligation to, and corrects its other destabilizing behaviors, the U.S. may reconsider. So how do we, is that going to work? 
Do we have any reason to believe that that's going to cause Russia to, to reassess its position? What analysis has been done on that? Do we want to use more nuclear weapons as a way to force them to the table? I'm not sure that's a good idea. And then there's other issues, and I'll end here. There's issues related to nuclear security, which is something that I worked on a lot when I was in the Obama administration. What are the ideas of the nuclear security issue, which is to reduce the amount of, of nuclear material, is that you don't want a lot more nuclear weapons. More nuclear weapons mean more nuclear material. We often say we have to reduce, we have to consolidate, we have to get rid of the unnecessary material, we have to, to put security around all vulnerable nuclear material. But what are we doing if we build more nuclear weapons? How is that going to be uh, understood by countries who worked hard on with us in the past on the nuclear security summits to try to ensure that we prevent uh, as much as possible nuclear terrorism? So those are some of my thoughts. Um, there's other things. What are thoughts that could happen in any time? Uh, discussions at the IEA? You know, those, there are always very political discussions there that take place. It would be interesting to see how the U.S. deals with countries who are going to push back on them based on our statements about nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's other regimes out there as well, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I thought that was a very comprehensive overview. You gave us a lot of issues we want to uh, ideally talk about further. Um, our uh, final speaker is Simon Limage. He uh, is uh, formally just recently left the position as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nonproliferation Programs at the State Department. Um, prior to that, he was Chief of Staff and the Undersecretary of Arms Control in the International Security Department. And as mentioned, he also he's, uh, served in, the, in Capitol Hill uh, in both the House and Senate, working for Senator Kerry and Congressman Ellen Tauscher. And so thank you very much, and looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Richard, and thanks to all of you. This is, I think, exciting for people like us to be on this panel. Every eight years, we come out of the woodwork. There's a nuclear posture review. It's nuclear Lollapalooza for three weeks, I think has been suggested. There's been a lot of conferences and panels, but none of this would have value if you didn't care or weren't interested or have a, be one of our quote unquote stakeholders. So I think uh, it's also exciting for me to be here with Ambassador Jenkins and with uh, Rebecca, who I've shared both uh, professional and personal uh, connections with over the years. Um, and also credit to Richard, I think, for having a fairly balanced panel with uh, interdisciplinary uh, background. And I stress that because one of my pet peeves in the, in the nuclear policy world is that um, folks who work on nuclear weapons, present company accepted, have a hard time uh, gaining lessons and engaging with other related disciplines. If you work in biosecurity, you've long understood that you need to engage with the health community. If you work on chemical security issues, you've long learned, known that you need to engage with industry to get a lot done. The nuclear world often appears like it talks to itself, has the same debates, and talks about issues a bit in a vacuum. So I think this is a little different uh, here. Um, so as I was thinking about this particular group and, and what I could add, the first thought in my head is we've seen this movie before. Um, as, as Richard uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I spent nine years uh, working for then Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher uh, in Congress. She represented two nuclear labs, Lawrence Livermore and the California campus of Sandia National Lab. I've had more conversations than I can remember about seeking funding for the National Ignition Facility, the cornerstone of stockpile stewardship and our abilities, our nation's ability to verify the credibility uh, of our nuclear arsenal short of underground nuclear testing. Um, just last week, I had another flashback. There was a three-day uh, nuclear deterrence summit, uh, and the outgoing director of Los Alamos National Lab, Dr. Terry Wallace, talked about the importance of confidence in the nuclear stockpile and the process by which it is assessed in the absence of underground testing. He talked about a sense of fatigue in the complex, the need for more investment to recapitalize facilities from the 1950s. He talked about the importance of the people who do the work in the complex and whose skills need to be maintained. Uh, going back, I spent several years working uh, with former Congressman John Spratt 
to maintain the Spratt first ban on uh, R&D into low yield nuclear weapons. I've had conversations, as I know Rebecca has had, with multiple STRATCOM commanders, including then General Cartwright, about at the time, 12, 15 years ago, the increasing value of the nuclear conventional mix in our strategic deterrent. I've also debated the reliable replacement warhead with those who saw it as an engine for transformation of our nuclear enterprise, which would reduce the need for nuclear testing and allow for a much smaller stockpile. I then spent the next seven years working at the State Department at the intersection between diplomacy and national security. Uh, I was able to participate in 2010 in the Nuclear Posture Review at the time, which historically, for the nerds keeping track, this was the first time the State Department was involved in the development of the NPR uh, and continues to have a strong role in the process. I credit the Trump administration for maintaining that tradition because once you've developed your strategy, you need to sell it to allies who understood uh, a previous approach and, and need to be brought along uh, with a new policy approach. So I've had, as I think my colleagues on this panel as well, a lot of conversations with allies and reassuring conversations and, and, and others to, to explain where we were headed. Um, as a sort of a twist on what's been said here before, like the quadrennial defense uh, review for the Pentagon or the national security strategy for the administration, the NPR, I would say, is a marketing document meant to signal policy preferences to a number of stakeholders, to Congress, uh, to our allies, to our adversar adversaries, and to the public at large. Uh, the NPR is a contextual frame, but it's not the same as a warhead plan or as a budget document. And so while there are some items in language that I find concerning, uh, I'm more disappointed, I think, from a messaging perspective than really from a substantive perspective. Funding decisions and implementation will be the work of Congress and of the administration. And currently, there's a strong bipartisan uh, support for the program of record to modernize the nuclear weapons complex. As I think has been pointed out by a lot of folks who work in that complex, it is already working flat out and Congress, in my opinion, is unlikely to devote a significant amount of new resources beyond the program of record. So I think at worst, we might stay with the status quo. I, obviously, a lot of the programs identified in the NPR are uh, long lead time items. Uh, some are shorter, but uh, this bears further scrutiny. If the administration aggressively makes the case for some of the new directions in the NPR, and if Democrats take back the House, or both houses in the near term, then the consensus may shatter and the NPR's relevance may be even less. I will give credit where it is due. There's been much discussion, as Rebecca has suggested, about what is different between 2010 and 2018. With regard to the value placed on nonproliferation engagement with partner countries, something I care mostly about, uh, it's been my background of managing those programs with the State Department, both documents boost those programs. The 2010 NPR included a, chap a chapter, quote, on preventing nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism, <clears throat> which asserted that the United States would lead expanded international efforts to rebuild and strengthen the global nonproliferation regime and accelerate efforts to prevent nuclear terrorism. It called for strengthening a lot of the international organizations involved in this work, like the IAEA, but treaties like the NPT, impeding sensitive nuclear trade, promoting peaceful uses of nuclear energy, highlighting the work of the state energy and defense department's threat reduction programs, and calling for progress on arms control. The 2018 NPR on page 71 states that, quote, to further strengthen the NPT regime, the United States will support initiatives to improve capabilities to detect, deter, and attribute proliferation and use, reduce the vulnerability of nuclear and radiological materials to theft or seizure around the world, reduce the availability of proliferation sensitive equipment and technologies through illicit transfers. These activities will reduce potential terrorist access to this equipment and technology. The United States will also support the efforts of multilateral supplier regimes, even though they're voluntary, they have their place, of the Zanger Committee and the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Uh, additionally, the United States will continue to work with allies and partners to disrupt proliferation networks, interdict transfers of related WMD technology and expertise, prevent the employment of improvised nuclear devices, attribute responsibility, and mitigate the consequences of WMD employment. All those terms have 
bureaucratic hooks within the Department of Energy, the State Department, and the Pentagon. So for those who work there, uh, this is uh, welcome news. And then, shockingly, uh, for an administration that has had some concerns, as I think has been shared by, in a bipartisan way over the years, there's support for a United Nations agency, the IAEA. Despite these challenges, the institutions that support the NPT, such as the International Atomic Energy Agency, help identify violations, provide evidentiary support for the imposition of multilateral sanctions, and as in the case with Iran, establish international monitoring and ver verification capabilities, so on and so forth. The fact that the non-proliferation regime and the programs that combat WMD are mentioned in the NPR is no small feat for those who have a longer historical memory. These programs have not always enjoyed bipartisan support. In the early and mid-2000s, they were often pilfered to fund other higher priorities like missile defense and other parts of the energy and DOD budgets. And I, I come at this slightly differently, but I noticed a striking moment of humility about the limitations of nuclear weapons. On page 67, quote, Although the role of nuclear U.S. nuclear weapons in countering nuclear terrorism is limited, for effective deterrence, our, adver our adversaries must understand that a terrorist nuclear attack against the United States or its allies and partners would qualify as an extreme circumstance under which the United States could consider the ultimate form of retaliation. And lastly, Ambassador Jenkins was right. There isn't much on the JCPOA, but there is the line that Although the JCPOA may constrain Tehran's nuclear program, Iran retains the ability to produce weapons-grade uranium for use in a nuclear weapon if it decides to do so. So there is a nod to the value of the JCPOA, which is as its negotiators intended. Um, the 2018 NPR does very little, as Ambassador Jenkins has said, uh, in support of additional arms control measures, but it does offer some helpful language related to the CTBT. Although the United States will not seek Senate ratification of the CTBT, it will continue to support the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Preparatory Committee, as well as the related International Monitoring System and the International Data Center, which detect nuclear tests and monitor seismic activity. We can credit detection of uh, the recent uh, uh, North Korean nuclear tests with that uh, infrastructure that the United States invests in year after year. Uh, now, of course, there are some problematic signals, and I, I don't want to repeat too much of what's been said, but from my, what I was looking for and what I saw was the focus on low-yield options that don't necessarily flesh out the circumstances of their use. Strategic ambiguity is certainly one thing. Using nuclear weapons against a cyber attack, maybe, is another. Uh, there's no such thing, in my view, and, and, and for those who are in this business, you, you might agree, there's no such thing as a surgical nuclear capability. Radiation fallout is not easily controlled, and the political impact is irreversible. Uh, there's been a lot said over the, couple, the last couple of weeks about the extensive det uh, discussion of gaps in our current deterrent mix, which in my view, sends the wrong message to our, adversary, our adversaries and to our allies, and I think says something about the quality of our deterrent that I don't necessarily agree with. For example, uh, STRATCOM General Hyten in the past, uh, in the last year, has been quoted as saying that he's impressed by the current flexibility in our nuclear posture. He said this before the NPR came out. So you can't really have it both ways. Either we have what we need or we don't. Um, as others have suggested, there may be a slight overreading of Russian ambitions. Uh, Austin Long has a much quoted article in War on the Rocks uh, suggesting that Vladimir Putin, quote, has shown little appetite for invoking the use of nuclear weapons over anything else than grave threats to vital nuclear interests. The new NPR does not make the case for how nuclear weapons would either be perceived as countering Russia's own nuclear modernization program or deal with non-state actors. Uh, and in my view, and this is a a, a problem that it shares with the 2010 NPR, it conflates chemical, biological, and nuclear threats. We can talk about that more if you're interested. Uh, we have an actual use of WND that's been ongoing for the last uh, two years. Uh, as recently as two weeks ago, the Assad regime was reported to be developing additional sophisticated delivery systems for chemical weapons. Do, uh, does a nuclear deterrent do anything to prevent uh, a regime from using WMD as it is being used uh, today. Uh, the new NPR is fixated 
and, and finds its only grounding in the actions of the Russians and the Chinese and seems to be a mostly reactive document that seems to encourage rather than try to shape a potentially escalatory uh, environment. I'm not going to get into the costs. We would need to, to, to talk about that. But for those who are familiar with previous budgets, uh, there, there's a challenge uh, there, of course, in terms of what the complex can produce and what new money can be absorbed uh, quickly. Um, and then, of course, the new start uh, has uh, lack of extension is a challenge. Uh, we hurt ourselves. This isn't really going to be something that's perceived by the Russians as enormously problematic. In my view, we lose an important verification tool that we used to have for no real articulated reason. Is, is diplomacy too hard? That's why you have a State Department. Is there no real interest in, in, in a further negotiation? To me, that was sort of a freebie that we, we kind of dropped that, that wasn't really going to hurt us uh, if we continued. Um, and then last, I think, as Ambassador Jenkins mentioned, the treatment of not, the, the difference in, in treatment of nonproliferation uh, is one of uh, priority. Uh, the 2010 NPR drew a fundamental connection between our commitment to the NPR, the nonproliferation regime and the efforts we might take to further bolster our nuclear determinant as two fundamental and related facets of our nuclear security. Separating the two concepts and putting them at the end of the NPR sends a disappointing message, I think, to our allies. Uh, and then, to me, leadership is sort of a soft term, but I didn't see much description or ambition for leadership in the 2010 uh, NPR. It doesn't really tell us where the United States intends to lead the international community. We continue to be uh, a leader uh, on, uh, on nuclear uh, policy matters. It mentions nonproliferation in the NPT without mentioning the US commitment to Article 6. Uh, it does not ground the U.S. nuclear enterprise in critical international norms, but instead suggests that all capabilities are on the table. Uh, it also, and this is disturbing for those who follow nuclear testing issues, uh, suggests that new, the ban on nuclear testing may be reversed if circumstances warrant, and that obviously is, is going to be a challenge. Uh, let me talk a little bit about programs, and then I'll, I'll uh, be happy to, to, to cover other issues like the NPT and perhaps engage in a broader discussion. It's easy to overemphasize what's in the NPR, what's not in it, and sort of get really worked up about it. Um, and it's also hard to draw a line between something said in the NPR and a programmatic decision because the NPR itself is not a programmatic document. But the views in the NPR, such as its support for nonproliferation, are challenged by other actions uh, taken by the administration and decisions taken outside the NPR. So first of all, the NPR may call out support for nonproliferation programs, but of course, the 2019 budget calls on directing foreign assistance only to allies who vote for us uh, in the United Nations and not according to our national interest. WMD materials and nefarious actors are often co-located in countries with weak governance and sometimes strained relationships with us. Pakistan, Iraq, so on. While they may not have violently divergent ideologies, they often have more pressing concerns, in their view, than dealing with nuclear security and may decide not to prioritize what we do. And then, of course, as you have two former State Department folks, it'd be hard not to talk about the 30% cuts to the international affairs budget uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the 2019 budget, which, in my view, threaten to reduce our joint ability to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, to strengthen the capacity of partner nations to detect and respond to the threats of WMD. Non-proliferation partnerships with our close allies and others do not exist on their own. Whenever we pull back on our diplomatic engagement and cut foreign assistance to a country facing a range of regional challenges, it makes it harder to persuade it to accept and install and use more portal monitors to detect nuclear material outside of regulatory control. To join us in WMD interdiction efforts or invest in interagency training programs to improve their ability to target nuclear material smugglers. Saudi Arabia was mentioned. Uh, as was reported on Sunday, and for those who are following this, you probably knew, knew this, next month Saudi Arabia will announce the finalists of two multi-billion dollar contracts to build nuclear power reactors. Whether or not the administration sticks to strong non-proliferation standards in its own uh, approach to Saudi Arabia could promote the creation or uh, limit the ability of a new uh, nuclear power 
emerging in a volatile Middle East. I'm going to stop here. Uh, my bottom line, I think, is that there's a little bit in, on both sides of the column, uh, but I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Did you want to say something? You were going to... I did want yeah, to say I something. Could, <laughs> I, could, I could tell. The disadvantage of going first, you know, I try to keep right. my remarks short if I'm first so as not to, you know, provide an opportunity for too much rebuttal. Um, <laughs> But the disadvantage is that I have to sit here so patiently, and patience is not. We're very good at it. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, A couple different things. I think it would would benefit all of us to sort of back up a little bit. What is the purpose of American nuclear weapons? The purpose of American nuclear weapons is is to deter large-scale war. Notice I did not say nuclear. Large-scale war. Chemical, biological. Um, Simon mentioned that... that, um, that this that the Trump NPR is a, has some strategic ambiguity about when we might employ nuclear weapons, and um, in fact, the previous NPR was intentionally ambiguous on this point as well. It, it the, the the Obama administration did not um, preclude the possibility that the United States could use nuclear weapons in response to a large scale attack that directly threatened U.S. core national security interests. And I'm not using the exact verbiage and the exact. In, wording is, in in fact, important here. And and the Trump administration's NPR um, simply just made it it very, very clear that we're not talking about simply um, um, only using nuclear weapons in response to nuclear attack because we do not want to create an incentive for adversaries to think that they can get away with using other kinds of weapons that would um, have still strategic effects, even if those weapons themselves are not nuclear in nature. Okay. Um, the, the second point that I wanted to make was um, it is a myth that the United States lowering our own nuclear weapons forces creates an incentive and inspires other nations to do the same thing. That is a myth, and that's not just something that right-wingers say or some people that, who really like American hard power say. That's just supported by the evidence. As the United States has, has restricted our own nuclear capabilities, we've, we've, we've eschewed certain capabilities like MIRVing, for instance, on ICBMs, which the Russians continue to do. Um, we, ha- we unilaterally prevent ourselves from testing. That was George H.W. Bush that pro- put that unilateral prohibition on U.S. testing. Um, we don't need an international treaty not to do that. We've, we've eschewed it ourselves. And, in fact, we reserve the right to resume testing if what? If we need to for the safety and security of our nuclear arsenal, because it needs to be credible in order for it to deter, going back to the primary purpose of American nuclear weapons, preserve peace and deter large-scale war. And so I think that we, we, don't, we don't do the, ourselves um, any favors when we sort of get in the weeds and think that if there isn't an arms control treaty that we're negotiating, or if the United States isn't lowering our own nuclear weapons, that we are somehow contributing to strategic instability or, in create, or creating a situation in which nuclear employment is more likely. In fact, I would argue, or I would argue that that's just um, the opposite, uh, might have the opposite effect. Um, I want to talk about Russia, for instance, or um, in particular here. Because the, Simon mentioned the, the other previous strategy documents. I like to imagine the nuclear, uh, the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, the nuclear posture review, the forthcoming missile defense review as Russian nesting dolls. They all go together, the big one national security strategy, and then they get more specific about how we implement them. The, what is the major thing that we've done as a country in these documents? No longer is terrorism our primary focus in our force structure and military doctrine. It is competing with peer competitors. Not because we're trying to start an arms race or because we're trying to pick a fight, because China and Russia are already competing and the United States is not. Okay, so the nuclear posture review was, con- was conceived of and was written and developed in view of this reality that is happening. In terms of Russia's nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy, over the last several years, in the nuclear, in the Obama nuclear posture review, it said that that Russia was no longer um, an enemy, and that was a new reality, and it based its NPR off from that. Since then, what has happened? Russia has invaded Ukraine. Russia is threatening our NATO allies, Poland, um, the Baltic states, both explicitly and implicitly, with nuclear attack. It has threatened um, American missile defense deployments in in um, in Central Eastern Europe. Um, it, is th- it is flying du- uh, dual-capable, nuclear-capable aircraft into NATO airspace. Um, it has a nuclear doctrine in which it is lowering the threshold for when it might consider nu- nuclear um, employment. 
And when, when we talk about the, 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 the changes that are in the, um, the, the Trump NPR, these are not bigger, better nuclear weapons. In fact, it's the opposite. <laughs> We're looking at smaller tactical nuclear weapons. And the reason we're looking at them is not because we just love nuclear weapons. It's because we are trying to change the calculus of Russia. When we talk about a strategic, uh, a deterrent gap that we perceive, it's not because we don't think our nuclear weapons are good. We think that they're the best in the world, and they are. It's that clearly Russia thinks they're a gap. And I know this because of Russia's behavior. It is violating the INF Treaty. If it has, it is it is deploying these these cruise missiles. Um, if whenever they build, I mean, Russia has looks like, according to the, the State Department, is complying with the New Start Treaty, um, at least by the letter of the New Start Treaty. To the extent that, I mean, and we can we can spend the whole rest of time talking about that, which we won't. But even if they are, um, the, when the Russians modernize their nuclear force, unlike the United States, I mean, we're Boy Scouts, and we follow the letter of, of all of our treaties and, and, and our own self um, constraints that we place on it. But the Russians are qualitatively changing the force of their, of their, nuclear, their nuclear weapons force. And if, they, if they've got a vehicle that has wheels on it or, or, or wings on it, they put a nuke on it. Okay, so um, that's a, a bit of an overstatement, but, but you get the idea of what they're doing. They're thinking in terms of nuclear strategy. And so if the United States wants to deter Russia, it, ha it doesn't matter if the four of us up here think that the best way we can do it is for another treaty or conventional weapons. Um, it has to be what the adversary thinks. What, does the ad what is the adversary coerced by or threatened by in order to abide by treaties? And that's what this nuclear posture review is trying to do. Um, some of them uh, are long-term strategies in terms of shoring up US um, nuclear force to close those deterrent gaps, not that we see, but that the Russians clearly perceive. Um, but, but some of them are very, very short term. The reason we're looking at another low yield uh, submarine launched ballistic missile is not because we don't already have tactical nuclear weapons. Many, many critics of the NPR point out that we do. It's just that those are, they're not in, a, in, a, in an uh, appropriate readiness capability. They're not ready enough. It's going to take too long to get the DCA where it needs to be. Um, we don't have um, it the, without going into sensitive stuff, that what we need to do is we need to have a, a low yield tactical nuclear weapon that the Russians find credible if the Russians believe that they can use a low yield tactical nuclear weapon against Poland, heaven forbid, or against Romania, or against you know, some of the Baltic states. We need to have something on the ready that we can respond with that the Russians understand and believe that we will so that they never do the first move in the first place. But, but right now, it appears as though, and clearly those in the Department of Defense are very, very concerned that Russia is doing this. Otherwise, they wouldn't have tried to get a, a low-yield nuclear weapon quickly out in the field. Otherwise, they, would, they wouldn't have done this. They clearly perceive this threat. And in fact, Jim Miller, um, who was um, President Obama's undersecretary for policy, um, wrote this great piece about bringing back sea-based uh, um, um, cruise missiles simply for this reason, because of what Russia is doing. Um, and then um, the, the last thing, I wanted to mention one more thing. Oh, treaties, arms control treaties. The NPR actually did say that, that, that when it talked about the New START Treaty, it said Russia's not interested in a follow-on New START Treaty. Russia's not interested in a New START Treaty. Um, Russia's not it currently, of course, I've talked a lot about the INF Treaty, but it's not, it's not abiding by that treaty. And it doesn't look, it's not interested in a follow-on New START Treaty. Furthermore, if the United States were to look at an arms control treaty with Russia, arms control treaties are not good in and of themselves. They have to, they're means to an end. What is the thing that the United States would want out of Russia in terms of its current nuclear forces? We want them to have fewer, less, Tactical nuclear weapons. The Russians wouldn't even let the United States consider or talk about TAC nuclear weapons in the New START Treaty. They outnumber the United States 10 to 1 in TAC nukes. Okay, and that's what they're using to threaten our allies. That's what they're using to create instability and coerce and blackmail our allies. So um, what, this, what, this, what, the, what the document does is it sets us on a path, and the budget, I think, will reflect, um, and nuclear modernization is still only about 6 or 7% of the entire defense budget, um, President Obama, to his great credit, funded the nuclear triad. 
um, and, um, and and this administration is is going to, to make good on that and is going to go ahead and provide the funding and then hopefully we will have bipartisan consensus like we had in the last administration um, and, and we're going to have a lot more money in the defense budget this year and um, get rid of the, the uh, budget control caps. Um, or at least we're going to pass a budget that violates the budget control caps. Um, but, uh, but all of these things are necessary, again, um, because we are looking at the goal of preserving peace, deterring mass war, and, and, and trying to prevent other countries who don't have nuclear capabilities from be having the incentive to go ahead and get them. Um, the reason the Saudis, I mean, I can't footstep this, footstep this enough, want them. Countries pursue their own interests. There's not something that the United States is sort of orchestrating and can just completely prevent other countries from pursuing their interests. It's just a natural thing. The Saudis don't want to be the, the country in the region without nukes when you have Iran rising as a hegemon in the region, has been um, legitimized because of the JCPOA, is being flushed with cash, and is continuing its ballistic missile testing and proliferation. Even if Iran does not uh, violate the, the letter of the JCPOA in terms of its, its nuclear program, the nuclear piece, it can do what, what North Korea has done. The, the nuke part was the easier part. The missile piece is the hard part. It can, can, the, Iran can continue developing its ballistic missile activities. And then President Obama said himself, all the JCPO did was it pushed back the breakout time for Iran. It doesn't, didn't eliminate it altogether. It just moved it back by a matter of months. So Iran can, uh, can bide its time and break out if it wants, get a nuclear capability, put it on those missiles. And if that happens, you're going, the Saudis are going to want to have that capability for their own security. And it's very difficult for me to say, you know, to blame them for that. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, uh, we have a, a half hour left. What uh, I have, I'm going to ask one question, but I want to encourage, it's designed primarily encourage people to participate and engage with the, the community. Also, again, I can take uh, comments and or questions from people over the uh, email. I've got a couple already. Just, uh, just send it to whites at hudson.org. I'm happy to, to use them. The, the qu question I wanted to focus on was the idea of reassuring allies. I thought that was important. I think at the, the recent events, the administration has stressed that they made a strong effort to reach out to the allied community, and the allies told them, you know, this is what we'd like to see. And they, they acknowledged that the an ally priority, in addition to ass being assured of deterrence, on, was that the U.S. remain committed to arms control, nonproliferation, and nuclear security. Um, and so I was wondering, since you guys all interact frequently with foreign governments, if you've been getting a sense of what you've seen. And then I would encourage people in the audience who might have uh, insights into foreign government positions to, to, to let us know. And, and you don't have to identify yourself. I know it's a problem if you're representing you're from an embassy. You want to make sure it's your own personal views on it. So you can just state the question or, or comment uh, when we go around. But for the moment, I just wanted to check with our panelists. What's your view of the, the ally? What, what have you been getting from allies so far in this? I'll definitely get to that. But just very quickly, since Rebecca had a very comprehensive uh, rebuttal, let me just say two very quick things, although we could spend the morning here. You know. If you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. In the 2004 budget request, for example, from the administration at the time, there was a proposed elimination of the ban that Congress imposed in 1993 uh, on R&D on low-yield nuclear weapons. Six million dollars, small amount, for adva the Advanced Concepts Initiative and the DOE budget to begin studies of weapons uh, related science and technology, $15 million to continue a study on the robust nuclear earth penetrator, and $25 million to ena enable improved nuclear test readiness. Those initiatives came as the result of the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review, which transformed our nuclear posture and put a greater premium on new missions for our nuclear deterrent. One of the arguments that was used at the time uh, to, to uh, uh, eliminate uh, funding and redirect it to other higher priorities was that we had, at the time, even better uh, and expanding conventional alternatives to hold some of these, higher, these targets uh, at risk, whether it's North Korea, whether it's elsewhere. And so a lot of what you heard is a conversation, although it was sort of more uh, a list of, of, of views that, that I certainly respect, but that I heard 
some 15 years ago and that we debated and discussed. And at the time, it came back to leadership, it came back to resources, and it came to a sense that we had other alternatives to deal with some of these challenges. And I would also disagree with the interpretation of what Russia may or may not do. And if we increase certain capabilities, is there a one-to-one -one ratio on the nuclear side with some decisions they've made that have nothing to do with our nuclear posture, that have everything to do with their own grand strategy, uh, economic and other uh, pursuits uh, that they may, uh, they, they may decide to use and certainly would have nothing to do with some of the cyber attacks that, that we're dealing with. In terms of our allies, I myself and, have, and, and many of the colleagues that I've talked to have heard uh, not so much uh, concerns about what's stated in this N NPR, which again, despite our little back and forth here, continues to be a more or less moderate document that borrows some of the language from the previous uh, NPR. Um, but I've, I've heard a lot of concern from our allies about the relationship between this document and some of the pronouncements that have come from the president related to both the campaign and then after the campaign related to every country uh, developing nuclear capability and some of the confusion about what we might do in certain scenarios. It's easy in the absolute to say that we need additional capabilities for unspecified uh, uh, scenarios. It's confusing when you're an ally that's trying to understand under what circumstances assistance will be provided or what was a small regional conflict in the beginning will become a much broader conflict between two superpowers. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I'd also like to, there's a, uh, with all due respect, there's quite a bit that I totally disagree with what you said, um, but I won't go into all that because we don't, we don't really have time. Uh, just a couple things. Um, it, the, the argument started so Cold War. It started we were just great war competition. Uh, it's it, it was very much as as Simon said, everything you know you have everything you have a nail you have a hammer. Um, so it was very it was, it was like wow I thought it was going going backwards. Um, and there's a lot of specific things that I could talk to you about afterwards. Um, I am concerned when you said a treaty a treaty is a means to an end. Uh, whereas, you know, in the 90s, when we, we negotiated arms control treaties, those were an end. Those were a way in which we were getting rid of or reducing weapons of mass destruction. And that was a serious goal. And that was, yeah, the means is possibly to improve the security of the world and make sure that nothing bad happens in terms of uh, WD use. But it was also a very important end in itself. And it's something that we, put a lot of energy and effort into achieving. And I would never think that we should want to devalue the role of arms control and the role of nonproliferation, what it has done for us. And very often people like to focus on the North Koreas and uh, the Iran, but there's a lot that has been achieved with arms control and nonproliferation. And you could spend even more time talking about what it has achieved. So I think it's important that we not lose sight of that uh, in light of the fact that we do have challenges um, to some of these regimes. Um, and I would also just, the, the concept of the role of nuclear weapons is to use against all weapons, um, and I guess even cyber. Um, I think that needs a little more, a little more thinking. Now in terms of um, um, the allies, I don't travel as much as I used to, <laughs> now that I left the government. Um, but based on my having been working in air arms control for, for over 25 years now, I would imagine that there isn't probably, you may not see a knee-jerk reaction at first. I think you may see something from Russia and their reactions that they are so prominent in, in, the, uh, in the discussion. But there is gonna be a reaction to the fact that the US, the US has stepped back from this leadership role, has stepped back from things we've been saying for many years in terms of the role that we have in promoting arms control and nonproliferation in our obligation to Article 6 of the NPT, in the fact that we have wanted to take steps to abide by those obligations. There is going to be a vacuum. There is a lack of leadership now. Um, there, are, there are no roadmaps for next steps. There are no ideas for what we should be doing except we should be building more weapons. Small weapons, maybe, but they're still weapons. Um, and I, so I think that you will see, we'll have to see how, it, how countries react, but I'm sure you will hear some reactions in the NPT discussions. 
that are going to be taking place because we've always gotten hit hard because of what people perceive as our lack of abiding by Article 6. And this is not going to help at all with that situation. We're just going to hear even more now. Um, so I think we will be hearing something uh, as a result of this if I can from our add, allies as well as our competitors. I think it's important for this audience to stress, too, that nonproliferation isn't just arms control. Ambassador Jenkins played a leading role in the creation and the implementation of the Nuclear Security Summit series under the previous administration. That wasn't a series of conferences. That was the first time at a cabinet level that you had, I don't know, Bonnie, 50 to 60 countries mm -hmm. that gathered together every few years to make unbreakable and unshifting comments to reducing the amount of nuclear material that was outside regulatory control. If anyone truly cares, and I know we all do in a bipartisan way, at getting at the root causes or the material used by potential ISILs and other non-state non actors, you really want to lock up and get rid of that material. You don't do that if you don't seem to care about non-proliferation and if you lose that convening authority. So while I, I said in, in a positive tone that there is reference to non-proliferation and arms control, you actually have to walk the walk in a serious way and do those kinds of things. Now, I don't expect this administration to adopt one or to follow on some of the signature items from the previous administration, although it might be easy because a lot of our partners understand what that series of meetings was about and those commitments was about, but I would hope that there'd be an interest to fill that void uh, that was used uh, to, 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 to sort of address some of those issues. Um, one of my one of my favorite parts about my job is working with with our allies, and so I've got some great relationships with some of our allied um, uh, embassies, and do uh, do my best to keep t to keep sort of track on where they are and what they're thinking, and um, especially with the situation um, with North Korea in that region of the world, and then also what's happening with Russia in that region of the world. Those are the you know my my two concerns, and so I I do try to um, give an ear to what our allies are thinking. Um, about the situation and what the United States can and cannot do um, to to reassure them and and help um, contribute to security in those regions. And one of the things that I have heard, and I also heard that um, although I was not part of writing obviously this this the document for the for the for the U.S. Um, NPR, that I that I was privy to a lot of the discussions leading up to it. And um, and and one of the inputs that I made that I thought was very very important was that we do give a strong listening to to our allies. Because again, if, if, it's, if it's assurance and deterrence that we're trying to do, what our allies require for assurance matters. And, and from everything that I heard, they were given a great um, uh, airing and to be able to talk about what sorts of things that they wanted and thought were necessary, et cetera. Um, I have heard very positive things from the, from the countries that are really most concerned about Russia, that this was a much needed um, correction course correction from the from the last NPR in terms of just even identifying what the Russians were up to. And again, to the Obama administration's credit, once uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, that completely changed the way the administration was viewing um, uh, how it was going to implement its Prague agenda. So before Russia invaded Ukraine, the, the Obama administration thought that perhaps even after the New START Treaty, we'd go back, they would go down to a, a decrease U.S. nuclear weapons by another third. We didn't do that. Um, we thought about uh, CTBT. That was off the table, ratifying that um, once Russia did that. We thought about um, adopting a no first use policy. The Obama administration said, no way, we're not doing that. So the things that you're seeing that are corrections in the Trump NPR really flow from the end of what the Obama administration was already realizing there at the, at the end, to some degree, some of the things. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would just end back on the ally point. Um, uh, Especially when you think about Asia right now, um, you, we're all paying attention, I hope, to what's going on with North Korea. Now there's evidence, I think, in the New York Times today that there's a UN report that shows that North Korea has been selling chemical weapons or contributing to Syria's chemical weapons program. So um, North Korea, at its core, is providing a major, major um, strategic weapons problem um, globally. Um, as a proliferator and also as a um, as a rogue actor that's that's directly threatening the United States with nuclear weapons and our and our allies in the region, and and so um, again Japan and South Korea what they think about that um, I think we really have to consider and 
from what I've heard, um, certainly Abe. Abe has a great relationship with President Trump. I, I, that continues to get communicated to me. Um, and his thoughts are, are constantly being weighed and considered, especially as it comes to uh, nuclear assurance. Yeah, we actually have a question that came in online. It's really relevant to something Ambassador Jenkins said. Looking ahead, a successful outcome at the 2020 NPT review conference is asked to be difficult in part because of the recently adapted nuclear ban treaty. Um, how will the recommendations of the nuclear post review impact the 2020 NPT review conference and preparatory meetings this year and next year? And what steps could the Trump administration, this is the key one, could take to maintain U.S. leadership and improve the chances of a successful review conference? You want to you take that one? I will last since I already criticized it. <laughs> I mean, essentially, um, well, since, we, since we already made the NPR, the NPR is out there. The statements have been made, um, statements which are going to be difficult to make an argument at the NPT review conference and preparing for the NPT review conference that the U.S. remains committed to its Article 6 commitments um, and to committed to, and stay committed to its long-term leadership um, in, in this issue. Um, it would have to do something to try to start discussions with countries to convince them that there is still value in the NPT and that there is still a commitment by the U.S. To, um, to fulfill its obligations uh, under the NPT. Uh, it would have to start doing those discussions um, because right now, on face value, um, it's, it's going to be difficult. Um, so it's going, if it wants to do that, it will have to do more than what it's doing right now and, and be more of a leader uh, in that way. Uh, so the NPT is a little bit of a complex proposition because it's not a static document. It's uh, a series of countries that assemble and, and, and seek to advance its objectives. And I think we've said enough about what's in the NPT and how it goes counter to, to, to Article 6 and the priority given to that treaty itself. This being said, our partners in the NPT aren't all angels either. And, and we, Ambassador Jenkins and I, worked with Assistant Secretary Tom Countryman, Gary Seymour was the NSC, and others. Uh, and they spent a lot of time including with Secretaries Clinton and Kerry, uh, trying to bridge, uh, to, to build bridges with a lot of NAM countries and others who had a high level of grievance uh, against the United States. A lot of it was overinflated in terms of the high level of transparency that we provided in the context of the, the NPT, which uh, I think was not appreciated. Some uncharitable folks could say that the Prague agenda raised expectations too high in terms of what the United States was prepared to deliver in terms of its own nuclear arsenal and the pace there. So that is something that I think the previous administration perhaps miscalculated. But this being said, however one conceives of the NPT, which continues to be the bedrock for other countries, if not us currently, uh, of uh, international nonproliferation norms, you can't keep the team at home while the NPR is being implemented. You have to walk and chew gum. You have to have a strong State Department with diplomats. I don't even know if we have an NPT envoy anymore. But you need to show up at these meetings, especially I think the anniversary is in 2020. Uh, maybe. <laughs> it's coming up soon. Um, and, and so you need to be at the table. Because whether or not you think the NPT is an important role to play, and I certainly think it does, you can't not be in the room when other countries are making decisions about their own nuclear trajectory. Go to the audience. One thing I should mention that I've heard that the administration may be uh, putting out a separate nuclear security, you know, material security, technology security, the last part uh, uh, strategy out soon. So that might be why it's so short here. But that said, I think there's enough here for us to talk about. Okay, if you could just raise your hand and ask a question, make a comment. You, you don't need to identify yourself if you don't want to. We can also start here and the far left and start moving this way. Do you want to start with that? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Satoshi Shihata, the uh, uh, Washington correspondent for the Liberty Magazine and Happy Science Group in Japan. And I think the current NPR is very uh, clear uh, regarding the NSS, the especially the third pillar, the preserve peace through strength. So it is very clear for me. And, and my, understand, my understanding is, uh, for example, the, uh, for Japan, as uh, 
as uh, democratic allies with the United States, uh, the United States uh, strengthening the nuclear power is a very great relief because Japan is uh, surrounded by the nuclear armed and democratic countries, including China and North Korea. Uh, so the, as, as uh, in, in the Obama's uh, administration, so China and North Korea uh, didn't stop uh, advancing nuclear weapons, and that was, that was really a really threat for Jap Jap uh, J uh, Japanese people. So the, I think there are not so many debates about the qualification of a nuclear armed state. Uh, so as, as I said, uh, democratic countries like the United States ha uh, has a nuclear weapon. It, it, it's not a big problem for uh, democratic allies, including Japan and South Korea, but China and North Korea is not a democratic country, it's, and they can, the dictator can use the nuclear weapon uh, regardless of public opinions. So uh, if you have any perspective about the qualification of the having nuclear weapons as a state, uh, I would appreciate sure. the, the take, opinions. Why don't we take about three questions, and then we'll go back to the panelists. Did, oh, did, did, you want, did you want to ask them? Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, Simon made a really interesting assertion in his uh, opening remarks, and I'd really like to ask Ambassador Jenkins and Ms. Heinrichs to respond to uh, the assertion that if the Democrats take the House or the House and the Senate uh, in the upcoming midterms, that the NPT or the NPR might lose its, uh, its ability to be an important or a valuable or relevant document uh, when the last time that we had an NPR, we had a divided House and Senate. i just really like your response to that. Okay. Thank you. Well, I should take questions here. Uh, then we'll go to the other side. Thank you, Chris Bidwell. Um, we talked a little bit about the need to reassure allies, and that seems to be a, an agreed upon uh, concept that we should re, uh, reassure our allies. Question is, though, for the panel, do low, wheel, do low yield nuclear weapons uh, better assure our allies uh, if we go down that path. And, and the reason or my thinking, whether it's correct or not, is that low yield are more likely to be used uh, in response to acts of aggression as opposed to the Big Bang. Um, so I put that question to you. Would, would low, do, do, excuse me. Does the uh, acquisition of low yield nuclear weapons uh, reassure our allies more or less? Thank you. Thank you, so much. So, uh, we'll go back to the panelists. Do you want to, do you want to, start with you? Um, you can respond to all of them or either yeah. of any of them. I guess we could ask our allies here whether it does or not. I think, um, you know, low yield weapons uh, has its own uh, issues in terms of, um, you know, whether the one they're being used against can determine whether they're low yield or not low yield. Um, how is that going to, how is a country going to react differently if they, if they don't know what's coming towards them? Um, is there some kind of a assumption that if you use low yield that the responding country will do something different, but the responding country needs to know that it's, <laughs> that it's a low yield and not, uh, not, not a, a low yield. So um, there's a whole discussion about that. Um, and if, so if you're gonna use low yield, if you're gonna have low yield, obviously you're thinking that you're gonna use it in a different way. If I have low yield, I can, get something and I don't have to use the bigger bomb. Um, that you have to look at perceptions, you gotta look at um, how, it's, you know, how it's gonna be used and the platform is gonna be used for them. Is it, is it a different kind of platform that people can distinguish? There's a lot of questions in that about how you're gonna use the, the low yields um, uh, and how you're gonna uh, to change behavior and, and will it really change behavior in the way that you want it to. Um, but I'm sure our allies could, could give you their perspectives on that. Um, what, whether the Dems, if the Dems take over, whether the NPR no longer be relevant? Well, the NPR is a, is a document by, uh, by the administration. So because, because it is a document by the administration, it's, uh, it's what the current administration believes should be, you know, the way in which the U.S. should protect itself um, uh, in the nuclear realm. So I, 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 I can't see, I don't see, you know, the Democrats taking over and saying that this doesn't matter anymore because it is, a, it is a, what the administration, as any administration would come out with a document, so it has to be respected for that. Um, 
But there are questions about the funding issues. I mean, there are huge questions about the cost. Um, and even if you're a Republican, there's a huge question about the cost. Um, and the trade-offs and whether you can, we can really fund this thing and what are we not funding, you know, there's other things that we want to do. Um, so that's not going to change. So I think maybe if you have a Democrat, if Democrats come in, they may have a more critical eye on um, whether, on the cost issue, they may have a more critical eye on more questions that weren't asked, I think, in this NPR about um, how successful we think some of these assumptions are. I think there are a lot of assumptions that are made in the NPR that I don't think are are correct. For example, the gap and you know whether whether countries feel that we are we have the ability to do what we need to do, whether we really even need more. Um, I, I think that's debatable about whether countries think that what we have is enough. So I think at least I would like to see a little bit more questions about the assumptions upon which all of this is based, which should happen anyway. You know, there should be a lot more questions about the assumptions in which this, this document is based, but maybe we'll see more of that. You already talked about, you know, you want to talk about the low yield sure. insurance and or, and or the yeah, changeover I'll, yeah, in the I'll Congress. Be, I'll yeah. be as quickly as I can. We, this is like the game show part, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so on, on, the, on the low yield, you know, again, the, the idea here is um, Russia has lowered the threshold for when it might consider employing a low yield tactical nuclear weapon. That's what's concerning the administration. So what this document does is it tries to raise the threshold at which nuclear employment might occur. In order to do that, you ha we have to have a credible response that would change the calculus of the Russians that employing a low yield nuclear weapon might be worth the cost. If all the United States has on the ready are high yield um, nuclear weapons that, that it thinks that we, we won't, you know, NATO might just sue for peace if we don't have anything really quick. Um, that, that, that might be what they're thinking. But what clearly Russia thinks it's in its interest to heavily invest in low yield technology. Otherwise, they wouldn't have 10 to 1, and they wouldn't be so unwilling to include those in an arms control agreement. Um, and so that is the idea there. The idea there is to, is to change the calculus of the Russians that they don't ever think that they can do that and it would be worth the cost. Um, I, real quick on, on that, if, if you notice, you know, President Trump, the administration doesn't talk a whole lot about human rights in general. But one of the things it does talk about about human rights a lot is because of North Korea. And that's because it's in the context of an, un, an irresponsible, inhumane, despotic regime that does not respect the dignity of human life and therefore cannot be allowed the privilege and responsibility of having nuclear weapons that can threaten and coerce our allies in the region and the United States of America. That's why. It's the nature of the re regime combined with these weapons. Such an irresponsible actor that we don't, if you know, if, um, and, and so that your point is spot on that the nature of these regimes matter. It's not American nuclear weapons that are a threat, that are threatening global peace. It's the nuclear weapons of, of countries like North Korea in that region. So it's a great point. And of course, just I just have to note that Xi Jinping you know, just got rid of uh, term limits. And so he's consolidating his power. He has been for years. And that should cause you know, a lot of us to worry. Um, and then on, on that, I think Simon's point was just in, um, in terms of the funding. Funding is policy. Po you, know, you, you, you do have these great documents. Um, but, but things can change, the, the threats can change, the, our allied cooperation can change, funding can change. And so it's all the, the, the good stuff is going to be in the implementation. And so funding is critically important. Um, a, a nuclear modernization, again, is only 6 or 7% of the entire budget. So if you, talk, if you talk to people who say it's just simply too expensive, I'll just quote General Mattis. It says, we can afford survival. Okay, these are the most important weapons that the United States has. Surely we can afford them. Um, and I can go through different quotes from previous generals that talk about the importance of these weapons. And General Mattis is one that's so interesting to listen to because he was not already on board with the land-based leg of the triad, the ICBM leg, when he came in as Secretary of Defense. Wasn't positive he we should have the LRSO. He has been completely converted based on all the briefings he's had and the, brief, the threat briefings um, and going through what we need. And, and he is saying we need it no more punting on funding. Um, and because one of the most interesting um, uh, things that phenomenon that has happened during the Trump administration is so many Democrats that weren't persuaded by Russian danger now see Russia danger everywhere. And, and so I think that that might help um, those who are trying to get funding for the NPR if, if the main concern we're looking for is Russia. So I'm, I'm optimistic 
um, that we will have bipartisan funding, at least for uh, the bulk of the things that we need to get this done. Yeah, just to clarify what I said, if it was misunderstood, uh, Democrats and Republicans have had a, achieved a bipartisan consensus. It didn't happen naturally, but it did happen over the last decade. So I expect there'll continue to be support for the program of record that existed through the end of the Obama administration. What I did suggest would be different is if there's a stronger emphasis on lower yield capability and lab directors start saying more aggressively that ah, we don't have confidence in some of these quote unquote new weapons, we can have a conversation about what is or is not a new weapon. And there's a pr pressure on testing, you're inviting an old conversation about limitations on testing, on R&D, what really matters. And I agree that some of these costs are not enormous, but when you're looking at a complex that dates from the 50s, from the Manhattan Project, there are some creeping costs in the long term. And one of the vulnerabilities of the nuclear enterprise is that things take time and budgets are on an annual cycle and you don't have clear cost estimates. So there's a very strong, strongly worded, full-throated defense of potential new capabilities in the NPR that doesn't match the very slow resourcing of some of these challenges, which creates room for political mischief, debate, and discussion. So I think that's, in terms of support uh, uh, and assurance to, to our ally Japan, I don't think there's been any change in the posture of Democratic and Republican administrations over the years. The discussion over low-yield nuclear weapons is in part an internal conversation for the United States to have and to remedy. It's not meant to broadcast uh, to other allies any sense that there's a gap in our capabilities that today we can't meet either uh, in, in an assurance fashion. So I wouldn't take from this conversation that there's any confusion about how quickly one would want to respond to such a close ally in a dangerous neighborhood. Why don't we take questions and comments from the right side of the room, please? And then Um, I'm Caroline Milne from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Thanks so much for uh, the insightful commentary by the panel. My question is about the shift in emphasis on strategic stability between the 2010 and 2018 reports um, um, from basically kind of a lot of emphasis to not as much. Um, for example, in 2010, strategic stability was called out pretty explicitly in the administration's description of its relationship with Russia a little less explicitly, or much less explicitly with respect to China, but it was still there. And I'm curious, does the panel think this shift in emphasis in emphasis matters? And if so, how or how not? Thank you. There's one question back there, yeah, if you want to ask. I'm So Young, a reporter of Voice of America with Korean Service. Um, how seriously do you concern about North Korea's nuclear capabilities to the U.S. and allies? And do you think we can achieve, I mean, practically achieve uh, of North Korea's nuclear disarmament without um, change of leadership in Pyongyang? Nice. Um, actually, it was helpful for you to identify yourself because you also emailed me a question, so I'll pass on that. I want to read the last two questions that came over the email, and then you can answer all or any of them. Uh, one was, can any of our pan offs assure us that vigorous intelligence is focused on detecting any diversion from the stockpiles that others have said they will safeguard, and preparations are made to vigorously interdict anything that is diverted? And then the uh, other question that came in was, if the technological geopolitical challenges uh, or another assessed need to develop new nuclear capabilities were to lead to resumption of U.S. explosive nuclear testing, what would, what would response of other countries be, and how would that response impact U.S. security? So four questions you can answer in your all. Do you want, do you want to start? You want to go ahead, Ambassador Daniel. Um, so the, the last one was about basically what happens if we start testing. Yeah. Um, and the question about strategic stability is why, what effect we don't have that reference um, in the 2018 when we talk about Russia. It's mentioned, but not as much as it's yeah. um, Well, if we started testing again, uh, that would be, I think, a pretty big thing because um, you have um, you have a lot of countries who have signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The U.S. has not ratified the treaty. A lot of countries have ratified the treaty. A lot of countries are already um, under a commitment not to test. There has not been, I don't know, um, 
a serious step that I can that I know of um, of another country um, well, sorry, North Korea, of course, um, testing a nuclear weapon. Um, I don't have all the intelligence, and if I did, I couldn't tell you anyway. Um, <laughs> right. Good. Um, but um, you know, my assessment would be just from what I just from what I do know that the move now is to try to get this treaty entered in force. Um, the U.S. is one of the holdovers. I believe China actually has ratified the treaty. I believe Russia has tried, had ratified the treaty as well, if I'm correct. Um, so um, the move has been toward ratifying um, the treaty. So um, for us, the test would be a, a serious move in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, it would be a big deal. Um, just because, and, and it goes back to the whole U.S. leadership thing as well. I mean, if the U.S. has a leader test, um, other countries will take notice. Um, of the U.S. giving up its leadership role as well. Um, the strategic stability part, um, you know, it, it, you do have to, we, we talk a lot about what's continued from the Obama administration. Um, uh, it gives people a sense of we're still sticking with the same thing. Um, and so there's not as much attention as to, you know, some of these other areas. I mean, we talked about arms control and arm, and we know that's, that's that um, the, the emphasis on that, um, but strategic stability, uh, you know, if you take it out, it does just makes you wonder why. You know, why does you know, why does this NPR not have something that talks about stability, um, strategic stability with Russia? Um, and so you got to wonder, and you look in terms of the whole document. What is it trying to say, and what does it mean? And if you're and if you have the, the statements about you know um, Russia being the target and the one that's getting a lot of attention in the NPR, and you're we're going to develop new types of weapons to force you to get to the table, and if you don't do this, we're going to do that, and we're worried about your own you know, weapons, um, it, then you don't talk about strategic stability. It kind of all it just kind of helps you fill out the picture about what the what the underlying rationale for everything. So in that respect, it, it does fit the story that's being put forward with the NPR. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll take a question that, that wasn't answered on technology and diversion of, I think, nuclear material that, that could pose a risk. Uh, just to, to address the premise of the question, in fact, intelligence is a finite resource, and there is no current assessment and understanding of all material outside of regulatory uh, control. There are programs at the Department of Energy, at the State Department, uh, and at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency to work with countries to identify material outside of regulatory control, but we don't know uh, with great certainty the totality of where that material is. There have been enormous strides taken to, to secure that material and to, and to uh, work with partners to, to do that in countries like Georgia, Moldova, Kazakhstan, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there's also a voluntary reporting mechanism called the International Trafficking Database uh, that the IEA holds where countries are, are meant and have reported over the last several years thousands of incidents of seizures of material, not always weapons grade, in fact, rarely so, which is good, uh, a nuclear material that, uh, that that they've seized on their on their borders that allows the international community to get a handle on this. So, uh, again, WMD is important when it matters to administrations and it, when it matters to uh, specific uh, agencies and to the intelligence community. But at a time when we continue to be engaged in uh, global uh, campaigns against a lot of adversaries, state and non-state. The intelligence community's focus on this particular problem continues to be challenged and is an area that needs additional uh, resources uh, over time. Uh, you know, on, on testing, I think uh, everything's been been said. It would, I would simply say, we've all talked about North Korea and how important it is to be concerned about that. I, I would think that it would take some sort of rhetorical contortions for us to the next time North Korea tests for us to say, look, uh, this is continues to violate international norms if we ourselves are opening the door a little wider towards testing. What I would also add about 
testing. We haven't tested since the 90s, and we've had a ban on underground testing. Uh, and instead, since the 90s, we've invested on stockpile stewardship uh, 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 programs that have allowed us to assess the viability of our arsenal short of testing. So one would want to ask the question, to what end would one actually need to test? Is it a political statement, or is it something that's necessary to verify uh, the quality and credibility of a new weapon? Um, again, that's a conversation for another time. Sure. Um, yeah, I would just say that uh, to, to in any way see sort of any moral equivalence between the United States resuming testing for the sake of the reliability of our nuclear deterrent and our nuclear umbrella that we, that we provide our allies with the, what the North Koreans are doing in, in testing in open violation of UN Security Council resolutions is just simply um, it's just not a, a fair um, uh, equivalence there. Um, and so, you know, the United States is only going to resume testing if we need it to make sure that our nuclear deterrent is, is credible and safe. And, and so you have to look at the natures of the regimes that have these weapons to understand what, um, what is right and wrong in terms of how, how, they're, how they're operating. Um, real quick on strategic stability. I mean, I, I, I think it's a great question. It's a great observation because that's something that um, I actually think is something that's markedly different about the Trump administration in general. Um, when we say strategic stability, what is it that we even mean anymore? If we look at the globe and what's even happening, how in the world can we say we've got strategic stability when you have countries like Russia brandishing nuclear weapons, when you have the Chinese testing anti-satellite weapons that hit satellites and blow up debris and have space debris, um, when you see them pursuing these capabilities um, that would that explicitly target and hold at risk um, America's most vulnerable and precious national security assets. Um, so I think we are at a we are at a sort of a crossroads where um, what we have been doing, the status quo isn't working. Things aren't stable. Um, uh, we have peer competitors that are becoming more um, aggressive and, and, um, and the United States has to, has to respond to that. So um, I think that's a great observation. And then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just say is on the North Korea. Um, I don't know what Kim is thinking because um, now with this news that they're, that they're still proliferating chemical weapons to Assad, I mean, you gotta wonder what he's thinking because um, he, he must be thinking that, that this administration, the Trump administration is bluffing. I don't think they're bluffing. And um, because of the, of the rhetoric from the senior administration officials, because of the pressure campaign that's been going, I think this administration is determined to make sure that before President Trump leaves office, assuming he has one term, that North Korea is not going to be a nuclear power or, or, more realistically, is on its way out, practically speaking, from, be from, from being a nuclear power. And that's going to happen one of two ways. And I'm not optimistic. Okay, uh, just uh, one uh, service announcement that we will hold our next meeting, which I encourage you all to attend, March 8th, uh, 10 to 11 a.m., and uh, the speaker will be uh, Jim McDonald, who's going to, and it's going to be a roundtable format, so we'll play with him. He's going to talk about the new DHS Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office, what they've been doing, what are their plans, and so on, but he wants to engage with the NGO community about, you know, what, how to, to improve matters. But for now, please join me in thanking the speakers from today, and uh, I look forward to seeing you, if not next time, in the future.